Oh, if you guys need a spot, welcome. This is a great turnout. We're so glad you're here. Um, we are going to be pretty quick and to the point with the documentary, so go ahead and get settled. Um, but before we do, we're going to hear from our two fearless leaders really quick. First up is Dr. Paul Nesselrode. So welcome, Dr. Nesselrode. Thank you, Ashley. Just, uh, we're told a minute of introduction here, and then we'll get to the documentary. But thank you all for coming. Um, I've written my words down so I can be... Uh, clear and expeditious. But I wanted to say that about 10 years ago, my professional interests shifted and I became interested in looking at the use and misuse of scientific authority, scientific imagery, and the power of the naturalistic imagination as it intersected with human value and dignity. This led me to topics like eugenics and the Holocaust, and with encouragement and help from a friend, now colleague, Dr. Brian Shelton, I started a study abroad experience taking students to Germany and Poland in the spring to more intimately explore the Holocaust. This past year, I started that in 2014. This past year, it was fantastic to have a student video journalism crew travel with us and document our experience. It was the idea of Professor Rich Maneri and what you're going to see tonight is the result of that idea. So let me hand it over to Rich now. I think when Dr. Nesselrode and I first talked about this, we could not have imagined this. So thank you for coming. I, I had a writing teacher who liked to say, don't look, see. And I never forgot that. In fact, I've used the line on my students many times. I've learned that seeing is a very intentional thing. It has to be because it's unpleasant often. It's exhausting. It can even be terrible. C.S. Lewis in his book, A Grief Observed, called seeing one of the miracles of love, which he said gives a power of seeing through its own enchantments and yet not being disenchanted. So love, said Lewis, is not something that obscures our view of reality, rather it sharpens it. So I think the question that challenged us as we were on this trip and as we made this documentary was, do we love enough to truly see? So as we watch Don't Forget Us, which is the name of the documentary together, for the first time in most cases, I pray that we all consider that question. Thank you. This is Auschwitz in Poland. The sign reads, Arbeit mach frei, or work will set you free. It was a lie. In this concentration camp during the Holocaust, more than a million people died. Jews mostly, but also Poles, gypsies, Russian prisoners of war. They were gassed, worked to death starved, shot. It's my first time traveling outside the U.S. I'd never even been on a plane before, but here I am, trying to make sense of this, all of this. I had read about the Holocaust, seen movies. We watched Schindler's List before we got here, but it's not the same. Words on pages and two-dimensional images can't prepare you. Nothing can.
all react because you know you see these things in textbooks and you hear about them in history lessons and stuff and you never really know what you're going to expect when you're there and you're in the place so i'm hoping that being a human is enough in this situation to kind of feel how you need to feel and it may be overwhelming and it may be uncomfortable but i think all of those things are perfectly fine for this and I hope I get something out of it pretty life-changing, which I think I will. It's hard to believe anything bad ever happened here in this medieval city. It looks like a giant gingerbread neighborhood. Our guide, Christian Marks, walks us through Brandenburg with its quaint homes and shops. And then there it stands, right in the middle of town, a memorial to some 9,000 human beings murdered in gas chambers on this ground in 1940. It was the site of the Euthanasia Institution of Brandenburg. Here, Nazis and compliant physicians killed men, women, and children with physical and mental disabilities, along with elderly men and women too old to work. They murdered epileptics and anyone they deemed not useful to the state. It's, it was this killing facility, as you can imagine, as you can see it now, was in the middle of a town, in the middle of a town. So the people that were living here could see every day the people who were transported. I don't tell you now too much, but just to have an introduction here on this memorial. The people were transported, the people that were killed, with buses with um, uh, post buses, in the beginning they were red and later on they were grey and these buses were recognized in the city, they were recognized in the area around the cities, they were recognized in the facilities where the people uh, lived up to that moment so the people real after and after they realized what's <coughs> going on. I. I usually say the people have to concentrate, other people have to concentrate not to become aware of what happens. They really have to concentrate. There was a 19th century German biologist who said all politics is applied biology. The Nazis took this theory and made it real. We all watch, slack-jawed, as Christian describes how this place would sort of become a prototype for what came later on a much larger scale. Here. The Nazis pumped carbon monoxide from trucks into gas chambers. It worked really well. If you can kill 9,000, why not 90,000? Why not a million? If we had been alive then, they would have killed some of us. I mean, I, I always kind of knew this day was going to be the hardest for me because it's something about, so I have multiple degenerative disabilities that I'm probably going to be wheelchair bound by the time I'm 30 or 40, I might not live a very long life. So it's, um, but I know that my life is worth living and that I, I'm worth having a life. And so it's um, really terrifying and saddening and honestly even humbling for me, the fact that I get to live in a time where this thought has been pushed away because it's terrifying to think there was a time when they just looked at people who did not have a perfect form, perfect presentation, and thought that they weren't worthy of living. This is almost too hard to process. How could this happen, so close to where people lived and worked? They must have known. How could they not know? How could they stay silent? My father works with disabled people. Each has value and dignity in their own way. Um, I think about how there is evil in the world and how somehow even just the basis of life can be distorted to nothing. About 10,000 metal faces cover the floor. It's an exibit called Schalkehet, or Fallen Leaves Within the Museum. 
The artist, Menashe Kaddishman, dedicated the faces to the victims of war and violence. And do you find yourself trying to step gently? Yeah. Just naturally, without even thinking about it? Just, it was like I was watching every step I was taking, like trying to decide the best way to go, but like it felt odd because everywhere you stepped it was a face. Within the museum, you'll find evidence of 1,700 years of German and Jewish history. Our group is focused on 12 of those years, from 1933 to 1945. Meaning in a museum there is necessarily things you cannot show, like stories you cannot tell, because people did not have a chance to live their life. There's too much here to see and digest in a day, but certain things strike you. A letter from Fritz Wolfsky to his brother. Wolfsky, in a deportation train with his wife and six-month-old son, on his way to Auschwitz, tossed the letter from the train. It reads, don't forget us. Um, just, uh, that kind of reflects also the level of support for, for the Nazis. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you look at election results, for instance, well, there was still three. There's a farewell letter from Martha Corant, who, facing imminent deportation, wrote to her family that she would be committing suicide rather than face death in a concentration camp. Have me cremated and buried alongside the parents, she writes. And a letter from Marianne Yoakum, written to her family on the day of her execution. She and her husband Heinz, who had already been executed, were part of a Jewish resistance group in Berlin. This is the Tower of Terror, a metaphor for loneliness and cold desperation. A sliver of light bleeds through, out of reach. The void is like what was left, um, like by the people um, who died, and like it's like a, a manifestation of their suffering and of the things that we're not able to see necessarily. Um, but it was interesting to like be in that moment in something that exists but also doesn't, which I think, what, I think that's why the word void is like the best word. Outside the museum and throughout Berlin, there are reminders, including these, of what happened here in the 1930s and 40s when Jews were rounded up and deported. They're called Stolperstein, or stumbling stones, obstacles not so much for our feet, but for our consciences. On the stones, there are names of Jews who were dragged from their homes or businesses by the Nazis. And the dates when they were deported to concentration camps or Jewish ghettos where they later died. There are some 75,000 of these stones throughout the region, placed in front of the homes or businesses where the victims lived and worked. For me, and I think for all of us, this walk through history is starting to become real, and the most difficult part is still ahead. I feel like the town's so beautiful that like it doesn't feel like so dark because like it's so built up. It's the same walk, the same march that prisoners wearing those horrible striped pajamas marched to Sachsenhausen concentration camp, which sits right on the edge of a residential neighborhood. All of these houses were here in 1940. Of course, the prisoners would basically take the same walk we did off of that the train ramp, very similar, very close to where we came off, and take that same walk, um, suggesting that this was much more of a public event than perhaps we might imagine. Um, 
that uh, people were aware that um, people were coming and not necessarily going from here. Sachsenhausen was one of the earlier and smaller camps preserved primarily for so-called enemies of the state. Political prisoners, communists, homosexuals, gypsies, and there was a Jewish section. One of the first things the prisoners would have seen in what was called Building A is the familiar message, in all of its irony, work will set you free. Many of the prisoners here were worked to death. So, and this is the roll call square here, this semicircle. And it means every morning uh, before they left for work, they had to come here to be counted, yeah, so to say. And every evening or after work was over, after returning here, also they had to stand and be counted. And that could have taken a long time. And it was regarded as whether it was hot, warm, cold, snowing, raining, and whatever. And it was part of the torture as well, yeah, so to say. About 200,000 were imprisoned here between 1936 and 1945. The area for the firing squad has been preserved, along with the chimneys of the crematorium, Building Z, the final stop. A Nazi attempt at humor. It is amazing when you consider what has survived here for 77 years. But then again, in the scope of human history, 77 years isn't really that long. The barbed wire, though no longer electrified, is still here. The towers where German guards armed with machine guns could fire down on anyone not working hard enough. Many of the barracks are gone and only their outlines remain. But some are still here. This is Barrack 38, which housed hundreds of Jewish prisoners. Guards were known to drown prisoners in these wash tubs. This cell block housed special prisoners, priests and ministers, prisoners of war, prominent figures arrested by the Gestapo, Hitler's secret police. It was a prison within a concentration camp. The gravel shoe testing track is still here. The prisoners marched around endlessly to test leather for the German shoe industry. They marched until they collapsed. At least 30,000 people were murdered here and the evidence remains including the original gallows, now preserved in a museum on the site. Those people got hanged. And there is one We're back in Berlin, still trying to understand what we just saw in Sachsenhausen. Berlin, in all of its modern metropolitan glory, flooded with tourists who come to see, among other things, the famous Brandenburg Gate. But they come to see other things, too. The stadium that held Hitler's 1936 Olympics, the exterior is unchanged. The original rings remain. It was here where a humiliated Fuhrer watched an American black man, Jesse Owens, outrun Hitler's Aryan supermen. And tourists come here to the so-called topography of terror, built on top of what was a building where the SS and Gestapo tortured anyone they thought was withholding information. The exhibit runs along a section of the Berlin Wall. Nearby is the Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe, 200,000 square feet of uneven concrete slabs. The designer, Peter Eisenman, said the unevenness of the stones was meant to represent an ordered system that had lost touch with human reason. Yeah, it's kind of crazy, like, you kind of feel trapped and kind of, I know I got lost in here. 
This morning was a little hard, um, just pretty heavy. Um, just going to the concentration camp and just witnessing um, how big it is. I, I always imagined it big, but um, just seeing it in person just kind of sets it into reality and um, just makes you more aware of everything. So far that can go, I feel like this would be a sacred place and yet people are like playing out here. And it's just, it's a little disheartening to see that. But I also, I don't know what to expect and I, I can't see it from their standpoint. How unfair that the Nazis had the audacity to give their victims a view. Depending on where they were within Robinsbrook concentration camp, prisoners could look across the lake and see the freedom for which they longed. An idyllic German town, a postcard. Meanwhile, within the walls, they were dying by the thousands. Maybe on the, the kind of imprisonment there, I mentioned already that it could be a place for punishment that was on the one hand different kind of arrest uh, categories, but also uh, downstairs there was a room for uh, corporal punishment. This camp was constructed for women by the male prisoners of Sachsenhausen. Most here were political prisoners. Between 1939 and 1945, the camp took in about 130,000 women to be used as slave labor. 90,000 of them died. Among the prisoners were the Ten Boon sisters, Corey and Betsy, Dutch Christians who hid Jews during the war. You can find their names in the camp registry. Corey survived Robinsbrook. Betsy died here. Many prisoners, like Hannah Kipe, kept diaries, which the museum here preserved. Hannah's entry for March 23, 1944. No sleep at night, in very bad condition. The women here were starved and yet were forced to labor all day in the on-site textile mill, making uniforms for German soldiers and munitions to support the Nazi war effort. The women often made sure to rig the machines so the socks were stitched improperly and would wear out faster. And we know from Corrie ten Boom that she was able to smuggle in her Bible. There were no religious services allowed here, but the prisoners improvised, holding services as they walked up and down the roads, preaching from memory of the scriptures. As we walk around here, I can't help but notice the trees. A little landscaping propaganda to make the sight of such horror seem somewhat normal to a vaguely interested outsider. I wish these trees could speak. What would they say? Could they even describe what they saw? Better they remain silent. Maybe no one would believe them anyway. So back at where they did labor, when they had forced labor and there was some textile things going on, there were some old exhibits that were just being stored there. So that was all of the statue-like things that were, they looked human, but they were created in a way that they almost looked like these ghostly skeletons. And I think that's a reality for the women here and the men when they were here in the later years. Uh, that's the reality of what it is being in a concentration camp. And that's just a really stark image of it. And I think art has a lot of power. So that really impacted me. Um, I like the, the ground is covered in these black rocks. 
that um, symbolized like the the dark sand that was there originally for the camp but then within the the rocks and like the foundation there are indents um, to represent where like each buildings um, were especially the barracks those that aren't standing anymore um, so I think it's just it's fascinating to see um, how big it is with an open space but then to see how many buildings there were and how many barracks there were and then just to kind of realize how many you know prisoners there actually were at this um, camp itself and then how they're able to reflect that with these black stones um, it's it's really cool and, and fascinating um, <clears throat> I think something that stood out to me today was um, the way that they handled like pregnant women and just I guess the the prisoners being women in general like the way they kind of exploited them differently than like male prisoners just like forcing them to like stand like bare just like to come and just like kind of like just being forced to be that much more kind of uncomfortable and exposed and and the way they dealt with um pregnant women just kind of like choosing which babies they wanted to survive based on whatever they wanted and just kind of like the inconsistency inconsistencies with um like abortion and just all of their they didn't follow their own rules and that just kind of added to everything that we've been learning about. We're going to Krakow, about an eight hour bus ride from Berlin. <laughs> we have time for a little walking tour of old Krakow, with its beautiful castles and churches. But I feel a little guilty for acting like a tourist and enjoying myself. Then I remember the Krakow ghetto, where Jews were kept until deportation to Auschwitz. Part of the ghetto wall still stands. The wall was deliberately constructed in the shape of Jewish headstones a message to Jews that no one gets out alive. I'm not sure any of us know how to act. We all know what's on the schedule for tomorrow. But let's enjoy another beautiful medieval city and try to pretend we don't know what's coming. There isn't much talking this morning. Maybe because we aren't sure what we're going to see or how we're going to react. Maybe we do. On the way, we see signs for Oswegian. It's a Polish name. You might know it better by the name the Germans gave it. Auschwitz. Und ihnen unermüdlich zuzurufen, die Juden sind schuld, die Juden sind schuld. There are two camps at Auschwitz. Auschwitz I, the first, and primarily a labor camp, and Auschwitz-Birkenau, an extermination center, and the linchpin in the Nazis' so-called final solution. Much of Auschwitz I is still intact. The barracks and the building where the Nazis held their kangaroo court with space for a firing squad just outside. There were no fair trials here only a bullet to the back of the head. Very few people escaped from Auschwitz. About 900 or so tried, but fewer than 200 succeeded. Those who were unsuccessful were hanged, their bodies stacked on the corner as a warning to the other prisoners. Okay. 
that test or never take it to justice. Auschwitz I had its own gas chamber with an adjacent crematorium, outside of which now stands the gallows from which Camp Commandant Rudolf Hess was hanged after the war. And then, the moment for which I was not prepared. Things taken from prisoners, preserved for us to see. A massive tangle of eyeglass taken from victims before they were gassed. Kitchenware. Prisoners thought they might need it for cooking. Prosthetics, braces, and crutches, and the luggage. All of those suitcases that contained everything the prisoners could carry. They were told they would get them back. And the shoes, a mountain of shoes, so many little ones. In another room, the book of names, the names of the dead, millions of names. At Auschwitz Birkenau, many of the barracks are gone, though their chimneys stand, marking the landscape like monuments. This barrack has been preserved. These bunks held five or six adults. There was no running water or sanitation. ultimately die faster than even at Auschwitz I. We know the average life of a prisoner in Auschwitz I, in those better buildings, the water was cleaner there, it was gotten from a river next to the camp. The prisoners lived in Auschwitz I on average six months. Here, it was about three. Auschwitz-Birkenau is massive. It was a killing factory, ruthlessly efficient as prisoners packed in rail cars were brought here and either sent immediately to the gas chamber or ordered to work before they were murdered. With few exceptions, those sent to Auschwitz died. There are the ruins of the crematoria, monuments to mass murder dynamited by SS guards in attempt to destroy evidence. <laughs>
wish it wasn't such a pretty day. At the back of the camp, next to another crematorium, we came upon a meadow with chirping birds, shade trees, and wildflowers. One member of our group called it God's Memorial. We spent about eight hours at Auschwitz. It was both too much and not enough. I want to describe the experience, but I can't. I take a few notes, but for the most part, my pen is frozen as our group meets to discuss what we've seen. I need time. We all need time. You guys sort of experienced perhaps the moral hinge of the 20th century. There, was, there were moral issues that we've wrestled with um, pre-Auschwitz, and then the Holocaust happened, and the whole new sort of way of thinking about what humans are possible of doing opened up at that point. It's just like, you know, there's a deer outside the day. It was a pretty scene, and yeah. like you look out there, and if you didn't turn around and look behind you, like, it's the world we know, but we need to remember the fact that it was not that way. That what we saw today on this beautiful day, it just, I actually think it made it worse. Because I was so angry. I was so angry all day. Like I was so mad. Just so many different reasons, but I was just so upset. And the title of my journal was, It's Beautiful and I Hate It. There's some anger, but then, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking like, what, what am I to do with all this information that I'm gathering? Like, is turning it into anger really what's worth my time? It was, I don't know, it just didn't, it didn't feel real to me, which was, I don't like saying that, but it just felt like I was in this like set or like reconstruction of it and I wasn't there. After two days of decompression in Krakow, we're headed home. I went on to this trip kind of, ex I think, expecting something, and it was, it happened to be entirely different from what I thought it was. Um, it was weird getting to Sachsenhausen and Robinsbrook. I didn't, I thought I would feel way more just being hit with emotions, but it was more a lingering kind of feeling, um, just a feeling of darkness and kind of hopelessness. Um, getting to Auschwitz, that was, that was really hard. Um, really long, really hard mentally, physically, emotionally. I remember the one time that I broke down was seeing the luggage and um, just all of the names being on them. For some reason, it, it really hit me hard that, you know, not that I didn't think they were people before, but these were people and just looking at like the brush strokes of um, their names and how they wrote them, it, it really kind of messed me up. And then going back into the field by the gas chamber of Auschwitz, um, seeing the memorials that were put on the site of where the victims' bodies were burned. It was, a, it was a hard moment, but it was a beautiful moment, and it really made me realize that um, you grow up and you, 
you hear about the Holocaust in, in classes, history classes. It's kind of just another of history that you tests. But then once you're there, it's way more important to learn about it. It's way more important to know about it because, you know, we don't, we don't want it to happen again in any other way. And it's, it's really convoluted and hard um, to kind of get an idea of how it starts and how it'll progress. But I think if we really focus on being human and showing humanity, um, you know, we'll get to where we need to be in society. And sometimes you need to have uncomfortable conversations or go somewhere uncomfortable or, or be desperate or sad or hopeless or lonely. And you really need to feel those emotions and work through it to get to an end. And I think the Holocaust showed me emotions that I'm not used um, to seeing and in a different way that I've been experiencing it. And it really brought in my perspective on everything that I've been taught and everything that I learned and everything that I will take from it from here on. In a day, I'll be back to living life as a college student, going through my day-to-day -day routine, which now seems more mundane than ever. People will ask me, how was it? What did you see? No answer seems adequate, but I can tell you that what I did see, I will see forever. Um, journalism team to come up really quick. Uh, they've been living with this footage and this story for months now. Um, so I, I'd like for them to come up so that we can take a minute to recognize them. So Michael McClellan, Lucy Bryson, Maddie Anderson, and Gracie Turner, um, and Prof. Rich Maneri, come on up. And we would like to recognize you. Our students are amazing. 
So, so proud of you guys. Um, we're going to head into the panel portion of the evening where you can hear a little more from these guys, um, from Prof Maneri and a couple other travelers on the trip. Um, but before we do so, we know you might need a big, bit of a break. That's a pretty heavy topic. So we're going to take about five minutes. Um, so we're, we'll start again with the panel at 7.55. Um, so feel free to get water, use the restroom, grab a snack, and we'll get going again. The flex credit information will be after the panels.
evening. Thank you so much for staying. Um, it's so good to see these faces again. It's been a while. Um, I thought we could start just by saying your name really quickly and as an introduction, maybe what your role was in the documentary. So let's start on that and end with. Uh, my name is Michael McClellan, and I was an assistant video videographer. Richmond area, and I was the executive producer and also the writer of the, the narrative. Gracie Turner, and I was the director, the director of photography, and the editor. Madison Anderson, and I was commentary, writer, and narrator of the documentary. Lucy Bryson, and I was the international reporter and photographer. I like that. I like that. You just undersold yourself like crazy. Okay. Um, so we're going to start early in the process. So um, maybe this is a question more for the professors on stage. Um, but where did the idea for this documentary come from? How did it start? Well, if I remember correctly, it was uh, it, it started from a conversation in, in my office about the trip and, and how somehow we could get our, our journalism program, our media program in, involved in it. It just it seemed like too good a story not, not to not to follow up on. Um, honestly, I never really envisioned something like this, what actually came of it. But I, I think that it, it was really just um, kind of a collaboration between the two of us and, and, and how this could possibly work, not just to promote the program, but to tell a really important story and something that's going to live really beyond us and, and that could impact people. And uh, hopefully we've achieved that on some level. I just remember thinking that um, your student experience was uh, reading papers um, yeah, I love that the core of this is a beautiful, like, interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, so amazing. Uh, so for the students, I'd like to ask you, because um, even the ones who made the documentary also were interviewed at different points. So what was it like being interviewed for something like this? You want to start, Anna? Let's start. Um, to put it into simplest terms, I just wanted to throw up the whole time. Uh, and, and not from nervousness or caring what they thought, saying something intelligent. It was, this is not my story. And how do I balance my opinion with the fact that this is a reality for millions of people? It's, it's not about me. What is the difference between advocating and exploiting? I mean, we're here learning about exploitation. How dare we do the same? So every word I'm saying, I have that in the back of my mind. And you're already numb from seeing all of this. I mean, you might cry a few times, but there's so much that you're just... You can't even feel. There's too much to feel. So being interviewed was keeping all of that in your mind while trying to find some sentence to say. Yeah, um, I know for me personally, I got very gamer shy. Um, and it took a while for me to kind of uh, get used to the cameras um, and get used to just having them around filming me because uh, it was kind of awkward, you know, going through this difficult stuff. Um, but once you got used to it, you kind of saw what they were capturing and you kind of saw what they were kind of going for. And when you were interviewed, it was like a way to kind of personalize it um, and kind of tell uh, the victim stories through this documentary, through what they were filming. Um, so yeah. Yeah, this, the whole thing was such a balancing act for all of us, I think. Um, for the documentary crew, what was that like trying to pick and choose what you include, what you don't include? What was that process like of trying to shape a story together out of something as huge as the Holocaust? Um, I know when we went over, uh, Maneri was still writing 
kind of like the script or what Maddie was going to read. So I didn't really know what we were going to include at the time. So I felt like I had to film everything <laughs> over there while also trying to experience where I was. Um, but then sifting through all that footage, it was hard to pick what I liked because uh, I wanted to keep it very short and get the point across. And it was hard to, it was hard to pick some of the footage to go there. Any other thoughts from the rest of the crew, Lucy? Yeah, I, I think kind of just building like what you were saying, everything that we had to shoot was just like, it was hard for us to even put the cameras down. Like if we were going to dinner or going out somewhere, because it was just like, when do you, when do you stop? Cause you'll never get this opportunity again. And so for us, it was harder to find some time to like, okay, let's relax. Let's just chill out. Let's have and it's time to shoot and then time to like really take it all in because I felt like I had some trouble processing everything that was going on while looking at like a deadline and a project that was kind of due. But going back, I wouldn't have done it any other way because now we have something that can be preserved for a long, long time. And I'm very grateful for that. But when we're choosing what to shoot, we just kind of shot what we saw because we wanted to make it as much about the student experience as we possibly could. And being students, that was really easy to get that perspective. And if it helps in terms of process, so this wasn't, sh this was shot like a news story and not for film, for you film students, not like a film or a commercial. In other words, we didn't have a script and then went out and tried to execute the script. We, um, we went out and just shot, as Gracie said, what we saw and then after every day, um, we would come back, look at it, and I would write part of the script day by day. So it was just, and there was no going back to other locations to reshoot something. It was just, you get what you get, and you move to the next location. Uh, and that's that's how you shoot news, but this was obviously a much longer format, 40 minutes as opposed to two minutes. Um, so it was just kind of a day by day process of seeing what we were seeing um and these these guys and and i should say also maddie heineman who's not here who's at a golf tournament uh, uh these guys just did an incredible job um because you have to keep in mind they're seeing this for the first time but they're also trying to work at the same time process digest what they're seeing and at the same time shoot get interviews deal with all the logistical issues carry equipment um, a couple of days, it was very hot, so it's not it, it it's it's not an easy exercise, and in some ways, it's an endurance test. Mm -hmm. And they just did they just did a phenomenal job. Yeah, yeah, I have memories of I think Gracie must have lugged twenty pounds of camera equipment across the two countries. Um, so, with how hard the endurance piece was, which we were actually just talking about as a group, just remembering pushing through the emotions, let alone the walking, all of that. Why is the work, why is something like this worth it? Why make this documentary? Why is it important? Um, as I said in kind of the last five minutes of the documentary, you grow up with this distance towards these historical events. You never really capture them in a way that's lasting and it's very fleeting the way that your mind processes it. And I think, I think it's so important, one, to, to work through what the Holocaust means as um, a societal and historical event, but I also think there are so many profound emotions that you need to work through yourself that this kind of um, instigates in your mind. And I think it, it's just the starting point of a journey that you you can take and you can work through. And, and there's so much character development that goes through it, as well as remembering the stories of so many innocent people and victims and, and people that were hurt by this. So I just think the impact of this is just so lasting and surreal and meaningful. How about this side? Um, I mean, the importance of making this as a documentary is that it's to show that this is not a, a, a German problem, this is not a Polish problem, this isn't a European problem, uh, this is a human problem. And Dr. Nessel wrote, you're searching at human dignity and all of these 
uh, kind of intangible aspects. And what struck me the most is, as horrific as it is to witness Auschwitz and and just touch the things and walk on the ground that those people touch, what impacted me the most is that this is happening today. We did not know during the Holocaust that this was going on. Unfortunately, this is a human problem. And this is happening now because after this, I'm going to go to bed and I'm going to wake up and I'm going to think about this. And then I get to forget. Don't forget, that's what this documentary is, is it's to try and not forget that we have the privilege, privilege of being able to watch and witness this. So to make a documentary of this, this measure, if it is the least that we can do, then we should. Yeah, I kind of attack it from a educational standpoint as well. Um, I think it's important to tell the stories, uh, as the title suggests, don't forget us, right? Um, uh, I have a hard time believing that the victims of the Holocaust would just want us to sit here and sulk in their, uh, in their death and what happened. Um, but going through these camps, seeing it firsthand, um, just kind of puts into perspective, like, um, these stories and um, just how we can learn from this, learn from what happened so that it just doesn't happen again, so. Can I pose this question to Dr. Nesselrode as well? You've, you've done this how many times now? Since 2014, um, over and over with dozens of students. Um, why is this important to you? Yeah, um, every time I go, I wonder if I should be doing it because it's, it's um, I see what I'm putting students through. Um, and then I read their papers and I, I decide that perhaps it is something to do. I mean, I, so I, I'm gonna have some closing comments here at the end, but I'm gonna talk about the fact that uh, I've become very passionate in, in in wanting to communicate that, as you know, Sophia said, that this is not a unique historical event. It brings, our attention comes to it because like a collapsed accordion, the quantity is so great, but it's not a qualitative difference. Um, this evil is, um, is part of the human condition and our, ours, our eyes are brought to it, uh, I think thankfully so, to perhaps uh, illuminate our, to ourselves who we can be. Um, but so often we want to treat it as something, a historical event we can sort of distance ourselves from it. So um, whatever I can do to help um, shrink the gap, um, I think is of, of benefit. Thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna add a question here, y'all. Um, we're a couple months removed, this was May, 2022 and we talked about it a little bit but what are the parts that have stayed with you do you think um some of the parts that stayed with me was definitely like the items left behind those were like it was very impactful just like seeing that like certain things that we just have that we're able to have like we we have shoes we walk all the time and just that the fact that they had to give them up and just not have it and go without it and just to watch it there knowing that they never got to step foot in their shoes again was just something that stayed with me like months and into the summer. What about for others of you? What stuck with you? Thank you, Michael. Um, I think one thing that uh, has stuck with me and we definitely mentioned it a lot throughout the, towards the end of the documentary was just the beauty of it all. Um, you go into it expecting it to be like this, you know, place where you're sobbing and crying all the time and the skies are gloomy and just a terrible, terrible place, which it, no doubt it was, I mean, it was a terrible place, but there were so many beautiful shots that we were able to get. And I was almost disgusted by the fact that it was as beautiful as it was. I, I felt like it was almost insulting and, 
I really feel like I had a, a huge faith journey on this trip because that invoked in me just kind of this anger at God that I, you know, I've been wrestling with since the trip, but I've gotten over it some, but like, why, why didn't it just stay dark and gloomy? It, I mean, it, you feel like that's the one thing that, you know, that should stay, stay like that. Why did I not feel as bad as I thought I was going to feel walking in the footsteps of millions of people who were so wrongfully persecuted and murdered? Um, and what kind of point was God trying to make? Why couldn't he have stopped at a hundred? Why couldn't he have stopped at a thousand? Why did it have to be millions? And then why do we come back? And why do I not feel the weight that I expected to feel? And so it's a question that I feel like I'm still trying to answer myself, but I'm so glad that it was brought up in the community that it was brought up in, where I was able to talk with my peers who, you know, share the same faith that I do and talk with people that um, I've been around and then come back to campus and still be with those same people and just wrestle with. But I think that's one thing that stuck with me that will probably stick with me for a very long time because I don't see this being a question that's easily answered. But it's a question that I'm glad was revealed to me. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people say that it almost gives you more questions than answers if you walk away questioning. Anybody else want to share what, they, what they've carried with them? Gracie? I think the one thing that stuck with me was um, the field at the back of Auschwitz. Um, that was the first time in the eight-hour tour where we sat down and took a break. Um, I wasn't expecting it to be that beautiful. I, like Lucy said, I had, I was going in with the idea that it was going to be really sad. And we were sitting out there and I just felt at peace and I felt like I shouldn't feel at peace. And it was very hot that day and I kept wanting to complain. I was carrying equipment. I was having to film everything. I was walking around. I was very hot, tired, hungry. And I had to stop myself from complaining because I was standing on the ground where a lot of people had lost their lives. And it kind of gave me a new perspective on how I should have been looking at the trip. And at that point, I started looking at it differently. And that field, it's Every time I watch that part of the documentary, I just tear up and the shot with the deer, I feel like that just represents everything um, back in that field. Thank you. One more, one more thought. Thanks, Trent. Yeah, <laughs> I think for me, um, like uh, Gracie and Lucy were saying, like there was an element of peace within all of these concentration camps. And to me, throughout the summer, I reflected on that. Um, and I just think it's God's redemptive story for us. Like even in the worst in humanity, um, we can still see his glory and his um, kind of story through all of this. And so um, that's what really stuck out to me, um, you know, sitting uh, in the back of Auschwitz, seeing that deer even uh, the lake at Ravensbrook um, really put a new perspective on who God really is. And so that's what stuck to me. Thanks. Do you want to share? Sure. <laughs> uh, I was just going to juxtapose that with, I was really bitter. Uh, I, I didn't see a lot of God. I mean, I did. There were beautiful churches and they were golden and there was like no one in them, of course, for any of the services. Uh, they're beautiful. And I just felt really angry. What, what am I supposed to do with this? I'm, I'm human. It's, it's you and me. We're the problem. We said Nazis in the documentary, the Nazis, the Nazis, the Nazis. How about the people that were convinced of these beliefs? How about the people that were able to, to just murder others? There's no other way to put it. There's no delicate way to put it. Every day, get up, kill, go to bed. Every day, get up, kill, go to bed. They are not a, a distant breed. They are, they are people, and we are not immune from it. And I don't think that's something I'll ever forget or a thought I will be cured from. 
Um, thank you all of you for sharing. Um, we're gonna make a quick transition to another panel. I think we're gonna move the Q&A to the end after all of it. Um, while we transition though, these guys are gonna go off stage. Um, maybe be thinking about questions that you have, write them down um, on your phone. We'll be doing microphones through the crowd in a couple minutes. So go ahead and take some time while we transition to write down some questions that you have. Thanks guys. <laughs> Welcome, next crew. Um, I'm going to have these guys introduce themselves as well. Um, we've got a mix up here. I don't know if you all heard. We were trying to catch up from COVID, and there were actually two cohorts this summer. So we, we filmed and did a documentary of the first cohort. We've got some second cohort reps up here um, who are going to share a little bit more about the student experience. So let's start a similar way. Um, let's start with Willem, just your name um, and your major. <laughs> I'm uh, Willem, and I'm a math major. Uh, my name is Lisa, and I'm a psychology major. I'm Sam, and I'm a middle school education major. I'm Andrew, and I am a history and journalism major. Um, I'm Lucy. I'm education major. I just graduated this May. Oh, right. Yeah, he does. They know who I am. <laughs> As you can see, we've got quite a spread up here of majors and ages and all of those things. So um, we just kind of want to get a sense of where you all were at when you went into this experience. So what preconceptions did you have when you signed up for the trip? What did you expect? Um, so I have never been outside of Wilmore, Kentucky for more than a month. Um, this was my first time overseas. Um, so I was going into it expecting to experience both like a cultural difference, a uh, culture shock a bit. Um, and obviously like from what I knew about the Holocaust beforehand, I, I was expecting emotions, uh, but when you go to those places and you tour them, there's nothing you can do to prepare. Um, every place you go, I kind of like thought, okay, there, it can't get worse than this. And you would go down further and then it would get worse. Uh, Um, so I grew up in China, um, and honestly, Holocaust wasn't something that I heard a lot growing up. Um, so the reason I know it, it was just because it was mentioned in just the little tiny section on my history textbook when I was in China. Um, so I do know about it, and I have watched a couple documentary about Holocaust, um, which I didn't even remember the names of those. Um, but it does um, cause me have interest about this event because it's just so mysterious for me. And everyone around me, like in at Asprey, kind of know more than I do about what is actually Holocaust and how impactful it is. And the title of this trip, Human Dignity, even made me more interested about this trip because I didn't realize you can actually, it wasn't just an event. It was something that we can reflect on the human dignity. And I wanted to know more about human dignity as Christian and also know more about the Holocaust. Yeah. That's Thanks, Lucy. What about this side? Yeah, so leading up to the trip, I was part of the first cohort, um, which left 
pretty much just a week after school had ended. And through the, the semester leading up, we met every other Sunday um, to talk a little bit about what we were going to experience. But really, I personally was, you know, uh, booked leading up to it, pretty stressed, um, not necessarily with the with the trip itself, but with other things going on in life. So I would imagine that um, it wasn't really till the Soxenhausen morning where it all really um, kind of set in. Uh, we experienced like just stepping foot right into the, the first concentration camp just kind of like hits you. Um, and I remember cohort one, we all just like stood there for a minute or two. No words were said. Our guide didn't say anything. We just kind of sat there in awe. And everything that we thought of leading up to it, um, I didn't think about any of it because right then and there, you're just like overwhelmed with emotion. What about further down, Lisa? Um, I had a lot of um, preconceptions, I guess, of the um, trip. I've heard about it ever since I was like 13 every year. My dad would go and everyone in my family has gone at least Small once. Small familial <laughs> connection here. This is a Nestle Road. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I heard a lot of things. And I guess I experienced like when my family members would come back or friends would come back and I would experience their, like they were then being able to experience the emotions from the trip. And I guess I didn't realize how numbing the trip itself would be. And I, because I saw how emotional you know, people are when they're coming back. That's what I thought I was going to feel when I was there. And that was just not it. And I don't think I was prepared to kind of like, I felt guilty for feeling numb, but then I realized that that really was what everyone was feeling. But yeah, I guess I just didn't know that that was how that was going to be. Um, yeah, for me, um, I think I was expecting, I was expecting to go to these places and for it to feel um, kind of like um, how it feels to be at a funeral or how it feels to be um, at a, a graveyard. <clears throat> um, there's a solemn kind of state of being um, and a sad state of being. Um, what I wasn't expecting was kind of the like incredulity, if I'm saying that right. Um, this, it was just, un it was unbelievable to me. A question that we asked frequently was, um, how could this happen? That was a question that we asked uh, quite frequently. We're just here, and it's just huge, massive swaths of German and Polish landscape um, used to kill millions of people. Um, how could that happen? So not only was it like very just emotionally solemn, but it was also... A lot of people used bitter, angry. I know that you mentioned a little bit, Andrew, that there's not much you can do <laughs> to prepare for some of this, but anything that you wish you had known um, before you decided to embark on this kind of journey, what do you wish you had known? Um, I kind of wish I are able to hear more story from the survivors on this trip so that when I'm actually in that place, I will kind of be able to even honor some, them well. Uh, I know that it will never reach to a point that I will fully feel how they felt, but I think that would be something that I wish that I have known more. Uh, yeah, I think for me, kind of going off that um, similarly is... Yeah, the, the tour guides, I think, all do a, a good job of explaining exactly um, what type of thing happened, right, in, in the concentration camp. Um, so, but I think, like she was saying, um, 
more survivor stories of people who are actually there because there's a level of um, distance that you feel. Yeah, I was there, but it was 70 years ago. Um, so there's a level of empathy that I think I would have had that would have made the experience more rich if I had um, known more personal stories. Um, so I think that's one thing to go into it uh, thinking about. Yeah. Um, I think on a very basic level, I wish that I had known how, like just how physically demanding it would be like on top of how emotionally demanding it was. I found that it was extremely hard to like, we would do all of the, um, you know, museums, camps, whatever we were doing that day, we would do that in the morning. And then, you know, around three o'clock, it would be like, okay, go be a tourist and kind of relax if you need to, but go, you know, experience the city. And it was just like, I just felt like I just needed to like take a nap after because you, how could you go from learning about all of this horrible stuff and experiencing it and f being guilty about feeling nothing and all of that. And then just go try to be a tourist and then how tired you were. It was just, I didn't realize how much that would affect um, how I experienced the camps and just, you know, we were walking, I don't know, 20,000 steps a day and I was just was complaining. I found myself complaining a lot and kind of what Gracie was saying. I just felt bad about that. Um, because these people were going through way worse. Like it, I just felt it wasn't even comparable and that kind of messed with me a lot too. So I just, I guess I wish I would have known that that would be a really big factor. Um, I wish I had kind of prepared for what life would be like after I got back home. Uh, cause I, I went on this trip and had, all these experiences and all this knowledge gained. And then uh, I got home on a Friday. I had the weekend and then next Monday um, I was working as a janitor again uh, in my you know, normal life. Um, and that was somewhat difficult because so much of my worldview had changed. And then I began to be a little frustrated with the world because it seemed like Nothing happened. Um, but, you know, going to bed each night, I had these memories kind of playing over and over again at my head, in my head, because uh, we, we visited a lot of different camps and I would have one strong memory associated with each of them. And I, I also wasn't prepared for dealing with that. So, like, um, in, when we visited Plash Owl, um, I remember this one place where um, a mother and her son were shot. Um, and that, that camp wasn't very well preserved. So most of it was, you know, forestry. But they had like a, a dirt mound, you know, with kind of like a wooden plaque. And then underneath the plaque, it just said, what happened? And I think that got me, that got me pretty, that was in my mind a lot. I'm going to spring a question on you all, but I'll give you an example first. Um, one of the things that's beautiful about this group is you're all interacting with each other from a lot of different perspectives and disciplines and different things have stuck with you. Um, how have you reflected on your professions and your career goals in light of some of the things we learned? Um, I know for me, I have some training in counseling um, and to read the stories at Brandenburg of the complicity of the medical profession and the mental health profession and turning over their patients to be exterminated. Um, it it changes the way I think about what my job is um, in serving others and being a sounding board for them. Um, so for you all, as you think about what you're doing after graduation, um, how has this impacted that, if at all? Um, so like I said earlier, I'm a middle school education major. Um, one of my concentrations being social studies. Um, so the Holocaust has interested me. Um, and while we were there, there was a lot of um, we talked about it in the film a little bit, a lot of anger um, in, in certain areas. But I always found myself like trying to learn and trying to better understand. 
And like I walked in with certain images from textbooks and every single one of those images was replaced with something that I saw with my own eyes um, and pictures that I took with my own camera. Um, and like as I was taking those pictures in, like I used the word fascinating like four different times in the, in the film because like everything was just like I was just bringing it in and then thinking about how I can then um, re reiterate that to my future students, um, especially with like how young they're going to be. Middle schoolers are not going to be able to like fully comprehend everything that's happened. And as we keep, you know, going further in time, this certain event was um, more distant from the future, you know, these students' lives. So everything that I took, I gathered and like, I'm just looking forward to um, I'm trying to like have that personal connection with my students and with the event to allow them to really learn and understand more. Um, so I am a history major uh, and I don't know exactly what I'll do with that. Um, but over there, a common theme was that they, they lived on top of history, uh, that the people in those towns and cities would get up, do their normal routines, get groceries on top of these places where horrible things had happened. Uh, so we were in a neighborhood in Poland and we were walking by and um, I remember Dr. Nesserold, you pointed this out, but we were walking by and we pointed to a normal house in a normal Poland, and that house belonged to Amon Garth, uh, who is the Nazi in Schindler's List, if you've seen that movie. But the house was not preserved for any historical reason. The house was used by a normal Polish citizen. It, it was his house, and there was nothing different about it than any other house in that neighborhood. It was, it was, it was a normal house like in your neighborhood. Uh, and going forward with that knowledge, how many human events, how many cases of abuse, of, of racism, you know, do we walk by every day in our own neighborhoods and communities? Because we're humans too, and we live in the human experience. Uh, yeah. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Nelson, but the Schausehausen was a design contest. Was it? Was it? Yeah. yeah. The design of the camp. Of the design yeah. The layout. The layout of the triangular. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So. Schausehausen uh, was the camp near Berlin that was, it's a very experimental camp. Um, it's where they, they used to, um, uh, they used to kill people via firing squad. Um, they did that at Schausehausen. Uh, it was seen in the video, but they eventually moved to um, gassing and then uh,
purpose for a human being. And I, I value that a lot. Um, so in my classroom, um, I keep telling my students that I value respect a lot. And the reason why is um, I think you are all special and precious and unique because God created you and you are the, you know, just the, you are someone who deserve your the respect. And I had, well, there are some like students would not respect me, of course, because I'm young, I just graduated from college and they, there will be student curse on you or like wrote something, say something really bad to you. And it's hard for me, honestly, to like still loving them and even give them respect, you know, the way I talk to them. But when I think about this trip and also just how I value respect, I just try my best and also pray to God that, you know, God, please give me strength to respect the people that you created. You know, even though they don't give me enough respect, but I still need to care for them um, as how you care for them. Yeah. Thank you, all of you, for sharing. Um, I'm going to ask one more question because I think it's an important one um, that might apply to people in the room. Um, there, I've heard some questions on campus of students like, um, there are so many great ways to go to Europe and like nicer ways to be in Europe. Um, why are you going to these locations? Why, why do this particular journey? Why not read about the horrible things? And then when you travel, focus on the pretty things. Um, why actually go? Um, so how would you respond to that question? Well, um, life is full of both great joys and full of a lot of sorrow. Um, and oftentimes you don't get to pick and choose uh, when that joy and sorrow is. Um, and I will say that this trip was one of the most meaningful experiences in my entire life, that it it was it's priceless to me uh, i've learned so much not only about myself but around the world um so if you want a trip with meaning this is definitely for it and also uh the trip itself there were like a lot of aspects to it there was culture there was society and there was the history of the holocaust um and a lot of the part of that was just traveling with the group so um I grew really close with a lot of people I was there with. And, you know, I remember eating with them, going to the Harkshire market and eating her chicken. Uh, <laughs> so there, there, were, there were human emotions of joy and happiness and laughter that can be experienced on that trip too. Yeah, uh, going off that, um, when... Yeah, when I like graduated, <laughs> it was uh, graduating, but uh, eighth grade, uh, my <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, someone, Mrs. Shanding, gave me a book called "Do Hard Things," and I read this book. And basically, the point is, um, if you never do something challenging, you'll never actually mature. Um, it's the same way with uh, you know humanity or you know being a person if you want to be a better person or if you want to be more mature uh, what you have to do is something emotionally challenging so this is a great opportunity for that I've become one thing that I was very surprised was I've become so much more empathetic I like I used to be like well I kind of still am but I'm like a robot like I'm a machine you know and and that but but like after this experience I feel like I can actually read people you know and like understand their emotion but also like come next to them and then comfort them um, so that was like surprising but it was like but I never would have been that way without this trip so it's so well worth it but it's also like we we know like as humans that we're not 
Um, so we're bent towards evil, right? That's what a, original the doctrine of original sin is. But that is not, you know, the entire aspect of what it means to be human. So there's good and there's bad. For example, like in the in the at Auschwitz, everyone was talking about the beauty of where it where like Auschwitz was. They were talking the back field, where it's like forested, and it is gorgeous. Um, there's good, but there's also an evil aspect to this place. Um, so humans can build terrible things like concentration camps and do horrible things in them. But there's also cities like Berlin where me and Lucy just kind of mobbed around in and it was awesome. Um, and then cities like Krakow, old Krakow is gorgeous. And it was, it was so awesome just to kind of hang out in that area um, to go to church it, to we were we attended a classical music concert twice <laughs> and in, it was in a cathedral and the acoustics were like nuts and it was like beautiful and it was just like wow you know it was good the, obviously you're going to go to europe and there's such beauty you know but the challenging part is what makes it worth it you know going to europe is is fun but this makes it actually transformative um i think one room specifically that i still think about was in auschwitz one and i mean a lot of these rooms were just filled with like artifacts and just kind of stats of people that have been murdered and names and all of this and then there we walked into one room and it was just dedicated to like the lost culture um lost jewish culture and it was like they had this music playing in the background and it, it was almost home videos were kind of showing on the wall. And it was just like, you don't learn about that stuff in the textbooks. I mean, it might talk about how a culture was lost, but you don't like that doesn't set in with you when you just read it, you have to go and then you have to like experience it. And I think that that is really important. And I would just say, I mean, we talk about all the time we spent um, visiting these different places and these historic sites. Like there's some awesome stuff to do in our free time. And Dr. Nessero does a fantastic job of managing time well and allowing us to explore the different places that we have. And um, Give them a hand. You guys stay. Yes, sir. We have a few minutes left. If anyone wants to ask a question or two for the panels or for Dr. Nessel Road, who's going to stay up there. Dang it. He's going to stay up there. <laughs> Any questions for, for anybody from anybody? Bree, can you help me with the microphone? Thank you, ma'am. Do you have one, Annie? <laughs> Hi. My question is for Dr. Ness Road. So you've been doing this trip since Lisa was 13, as we have heard, and you've now made a documentary, which is amazing. I was in the second cohort. I didn't get to be filmed. Um, I was curious, this kind of open-ended question, do you see the trip continuously evolving or like what could be like a next step you envision for the trip? Because you can't just, you know, you've done more than just take students. You now made a documentary. I'm curious if you've even thought about next steps. Yeah. It's a great question, Timothy. Um, there are a lot, yeah, there, so I've been sort of um, teased or mocked that, you know, how can you do the same? Aren't you bored? Um, I'm not really bored with it. So and I, I don't know what else to do to, to go to uh, many other places. The expense just starts to, to accumulate. Um, I struggle with how to finish it because how do you finish this trip? There are no nice bows to tie it up with. Um, and I think that to, to suggest that there are, 
I mean, I've, I have with some, some trips. I've we've gone through Amsterdam on the way back, and so we'll go to the Ten Boom home to get a, get a sense of um, of sort of faithful Christian uh, action there. Um, but no, I, I think that uh, I think that I've settled on two places where I can get a lot done, and I've gained familiarity with them, and so I feel uh, increased confidence with doing what I'm doing there, and so. I'm not sure it would change much. I mean, each year we do, like this year, we got to go to the U.S. Embassy, which didn't make it into the video. But so I do try to add things or try things out, but nothing major, I don't think. Yeah. Any other questions? That's a great one. Thank you, Timothy. You might be left with mostly existential ones, and that's okay. <laughs> Hopefully you are. Um, we're gonna end here with a quick recognition. You guys can come down. Um, if we could have Dr. Nesselrode and Prof. Maneri come to the front, we're gonna give you a gift. Um, I work in the Global Programs Office, and I have the privilege of seeing the amount of work people like uh, Dr. Nesselrode and Prof. Maneri do. Uh, this is above and beyond their normal work, guys. Instructing is hard enough, let alone figuring out a coach in Polish um, for 40 students or um, figuring out how to cram so much content in and how to maintain tone um, and how to make sure that the students who are working and experiencing this are growing and processing and feel known and cared for. Um, and that is is not an easy feat by any means. It's, like I said, the only thing I can think of is above and beyond. So we are so thankful for you and the whole teams came together to get you these gifts. We'll let you open them on your own, but we wanted to present them in front of the group. Thank you. They are amazing. I hope you get to know them while you're at campus. Um, before we wrap up, Mm-hmm. <laughs>